Welcome to Women Investing in Women. Robin and I are excited to feature another impactful and empowering woman who is in this world making a difference in the lives of women and families. Have you heard of an end of life doula? What does that mean? What does that entail? And how are those services going to benefit you and your family? And how is that going to help you as a woman, as a caregiver, as a nurturer, make future plans? That is going to be the conversation we're going to have today. Janice, welcome to Women Investing in Women. Well, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. As we get started, Janice, can you help our audience understand what does it mean to be an end-of-life doula and how you bring your services to bear in terms of helping women and families? Well, thank you so much. Being an end-of-life doula, there are many different aspects of that umbrella term. Um, there are end of life doulas who are actually registered nurses, and there are mostly end of life doulas who are non medical. I am a non medical end of life doula, but I do have over 25 years of experience as a primary caregiver, as a cancer survivor. And I know that it is so important to have support around you and your loved ones when there is a health crisis going on in your life. Having a holistic, open-hearted support, and that's what I do as an end-of-life doula. I work with individuals and families who are juggling to try and navigate healthcare systems, trying to navigate um, working and making sure that your children are doing well in school, as well as obviously working outside the home because you have to have an income. And the challenges of being in a situation where you are fighting for your life because you have a cancer diagnosis or some other chronic or serious illness, um, end-of-life doulas are another lifeline, another uh, way to help you to navigate what you're dealing with. And so in order for us to be really conscious and aware and helpful to each other, we give open-heartedly in what we do. Uh, you're, what you're saying is just so beautiful, and it's it's a very unusual thing that you're doing. Um, and I'm wondering when you when you're thinking of an end of life doula, I I would immediately think of the person who is dying, who's passing away, mm-hmm. uh, and also the people around them who are caring for them. Uh, not only their family, but perhaps they might be in a hospital or they might be in some other setting. It seems like there are multiple components, multiple uh, stakeholders, as you might say. How do you manage to connect with each of those stakeholders? What, what, what are the state? Who are the stakeholders, and and how do you connect with them? Well, like you said, uh, the individual who's actually going through the challenge, they are the ones who need the support. And in order to provide any type of education or nurturing or support, um, it's so important to have an advocate. So I look at an end-of-life doula as a way uh, to guarantee that there's someone else in your corner working with individuals um, everything is always a case-by-case basis and so end-of-life doula is actually kind of an umbrella term because we as end-of-life doulas focus on our strengths and what services we can offer to someone who is dealing with a life event and so like I said, there are doulas who are registered nurses. There are doulas who are primary caregivers. 
There are end-of-life doulas who do nothing but help you to plan your directives and your final wishes and to also help you decide who you want as a power of attorney to help make those decisions for you once you become incapacitated. Um, So every individual doula has their own specialty is what I'm trying to say. (laughs) And so the folks that I work with, um, I was a sandwich generation mom. My mom was terminal and it took eight years on her cancer journey to go through that process. And I really wish, and this is one of the things that I really like to talk about and focus on is that we had had that hard conversation or five or six um, because her health declined like instantaneously and we were not prepared. And so everything that occurred after that, um, I would not wish those situations on anyone. Uh, decisions that she had no uh, choice in making, we had to make for her. And there were things that occurred that um, she wasn't happy about. And the guilt that is left to the people who make those decisions, it doesn't have to be that way. Planning, talking about it, um, working through that fear and that phobia is something that is so powerful and it's so needed, especially here in the U S where we have a real death phobic society. I have had the privilege and honor of meeting you through the speaker talent search process. Yes. And over time we've built a relationship because I am the caregiver for a husband who is, a cancer survivor who is also dealing with what you call the way body dementia, right? So there's a dementia component, there's a Parkinson's component, and there is a psychosis component. And when those come together, caregiving becomes very, very challenging. And you've been there for me. I you're somebody, I pick up the phone and we talk. Talk to me about the role of women, just like you talked about yourself, right? You have to work, you have to raise the children, you have to run the household and the family, and you also have to caregive. And so you become a trusted advisor and a partner to those nurturing women who women are the ones who pick up this role in 95% or more of situations. How can women understand and plan for this proactively? What advice do you have for women so that they are prepared? I got caught unprepared. Yes, <laughs> that is a an excellent question, Cass. And I am so grateful that we were introduced way back when. And uh, my suggestions as women and the roles that we have played throughout history as being the caregivers and the nurturers and the moms and the aunties and all of that, being aware that this is a reality for us is number one. Because even if you're an independent woman, you still have a family oftentimes that will come to you to say, okay, I've got this problem and I need you to fix it having some sense of uh, what you can and cannot do, setting boundaries in certain situations, um, helping to educate our daughters and our nieces and even our, you know, our boys and our nephews. We need to change a little bit of the way that gender roles are currently taught. We need to be more open and we need to have more um, community building. We've gotten away from community building so much. We are, you know, all these little individuals who are just dancing to their own drum and trying to navigate certain situations when they pop up. It isn't that hard to think about. And that's another thing is to get that new mindset going, to be more aware, 
to be um, more proactive than reactive. So building that into your uh, belief systems, into the way that you live your life is so important. And when we do those things, we have built little communities around each of us. We have built up uh, networks of information because that's also so, so powerful. Knowledge is power. And when we don't have that knowledge, and it's not that hard to get, it just takes a little bit of time and effort, but anyone can do this. And we really need to work towards building each other up rather than tearing each other down. Yeah. That's, uh, I lo I'm loving what you're saying here, building community, getting uh, information, getting information, sharing, supporting each other. Um, the first step is having the conversation. Yes. And you said earlier uh, something about that our, the, in the United States we're very death phobic or something like that. And I'm wondering how do you go about initiating a conversation about and maybe someone isn't even sick? You know, maybe, maybe they're just kind of getting a little older and but they look like they're doing fine. Uh, how do you even go about initiating a conversation that, hey, end of life might come or it looks like it might be coming sooner than we think? How do you go about even even initiating a conversation to then get the ball rolling that can create the communities that can get the information that can make the plans, et cetera? Okay, so having those conversations before you have a health event, starting that ripple effect. It starts with me. It starts with you. We need as individuals to embrace what's coming. We, a lot of times don't do that because, oh, that's in the future. That's not going to happen today. Planning sooner than later. Every adult over the age of 18 should start having some type of plan in place. Because when you're an adult, it's your responsibility to take control of your life. So for me, we didn't have that conversation with mom. And I know how difficult it is. So I started with me. Okay, I put my directive plan together. Hey, dad, look, we know what we went through with mom. I need to know from you, what are your wishes? What do you want to do about X, Y, and Z? What happens if it starts here and then it can ripple out into the world? Um, I'm also a Willow End of Life educator. So I also do presentations either in person or online to help to um, just get things started. I've also attended what they call a death cafe. And those are such interesting uh, events. Death cafes are where you sit around with a group of folks and have a beverage of your choice and a dessert. And then you talk about taboo topics like death. The conversations are not scripted. They are completely organic because whenever you get a group of folks together who have uh, questions or who might have suggestions about what they went through and want to share that to help someone else, it's a little grassroots campaign that anybody can be a part of. And it is so powerful. And it is just so amazing to hear different people's stories. And to get that different perspective, because a lot of times we are so stuck that we don't want to get out of our comfort zone. And some of these things are really designed to help us do that. So like I said, the first place that you start is with yourself. You embrace what it is that you want. You make those plans and then you start sharing them with those around you. And if you're a primary caregiver for a loved one who is either chronic or seriously ill, it's so important to have those conversations before it gets to the point where they are on death's door. And if you do that more and more, and we have more people do that, more communities building that, 
we will be in a such better space moving forward and being prepared for when the time comes. Mm -hmm. As I'm listening to you have this conversation with us, Janice, my mind is going back to even if we know what each person wants and even if we have everything written down, there are pieces with regards to home health care and nursing care and all of that that needs to be tied through life insurance and other kinds of options, even when selecting Medicare. What are the Medicare part, part F covers all the things Medicare doesn't cover, but part F doesn't cover nursing care, right? So what are the pieces you need to put in terms of health insurance? in terms of life insurance, in terms of home health care tied to life insurance. There are so many pieces. And as I'm exploring my options with my husband, I'm an immigrant, right? So didn't grow up here. I didn't know the rules of engagement when it comes to this, because I come from a society where the community shows up and healthcare is covered, right? Tax base covers it. And life with dignity till the last breath is how I grew up. But unfortunately, that is not the reality in the United States. What do people need to do before they get to the old age to financially prepare? Because here I am having to have given up my career and do things on a contract basis so that I can be a full-time caregiver. And as my husband's condition deteriorates, the way the U.S. process works is if you don't have the right life insurance with the right nursing care that you bought before you were 50. And my husband was 50 when we got married. We got married late in life. You can't get that anymore. Right. And if you try to access care, they will take half your home. And they will take all the future monies. And now you've given up your job, you've been a full-time caregiver, and then you won't have a home. Women need to pay, prepare for this because it could happen to their children. It could happen to their spouse. It could happen to somebody they are living with. What guidance can we give younger women and younger men to plan for this proactively because death and taxes are sure of it going to happen? So if that's going to happen, how do we make sure that the process doesn't kill us? My heart just goes out to you because I understand exactly what you're talking about. And with the way that our government and society uh, does not support individuals in these situations, one of the um, best things to start off with is when you're in your 20s, get a million dollar life insurance policy. I mean, you can afford it at that time if you have a, a decent job or at least, you know, $100,000. It will grow over time and it's a tiny bit of a cushion for you um, because we can't see into the future. We don't know exactly how much money we are going to need, but any type of investing that we can do, um, life insurance policies that we can purchase, there are stocks and bonds and other ways to invest that don't necessarily have to do with the stock market. Some of those are safer. Um, so being able to have a little bit of wealth management on your own and starting it sooner, like in your 20s, late 20s, because usually you're established in a career path by then. And when you wait until you're older, um, depending on your life situation, were you married and you're now divorced? Because unfortunately, women after a divorce are less financially stable than during a marriage or as a single individual. 
we're dealing with that on top of everything else. Um, yes, Medicaid um, has new rules out and they have, they have taken people's homes. Um, I live with my 89 year old father and I'm divorced and he used to have a long-term care insurance policy, but decided that after we didn't use my mom's, that it was a waste of money. So he just canceled it. Now I'm still trying to figure out what am I going to do if and when he passes, because I don't know if he's going to need uh, nursing home care. He has refused that idea because he doesn't want to be in one and I don't blame him, but he's also pulled the rug out from under me as to what am I going to do in order to make sure that he receives the care that he needs because he's not a wealthy man. He has some money, but with the way that healthcare costs are now and nursing home costs and uh, AIDS or anything else, that is something that I live with day to day, just trying to navigate that because what happens today and what options I have today may not be there tomorrow and things don't always carry on. So being so aware and planning as far as learning, learning is the big, big, big thing. Work with an advisor, uh, a, a financial advisor, work with a uh, elder attorney, work with your own family members saying, okay, dad's almost 90. What are we going to do? How are we going to handle this? How can you help? Um, looking to see what government assistance is available. I mean, it, it is, a, it's a work in progress and it, it changes yearly. So uh one thing I'm really interested in, in listening to you, you know, iterate all of these things that need to be thought of and dealt with. How do you individually, in your role as an end of life doula, how do you care for yourself so that you have the um, em emotional and psychological, spiritual, physical strength? to do what you do what you do. How do you care for yourself in your role as as in this position? Obviously, self-care is very important. So, getting enough sleep, making sure that I move. I'm not going to go run a marathon, but yoga and meditation and breath work and having friends that I can uh, go out with and just relax. Having a support system for me is just as important as having a support system for those that I care for. And I've come across way too many primary caregivers who are just burnt because they don't have that time for themselves. And then they end up getting sick and they end up dying before the person that they're caring for because they have just used up all of their inner strength. And you can't do that. You have to have time for you. So I, I just encourage everyone to remember that you are just as important as those that you are caring for. And it took me a while to figure that out after I went through my own journey with mom. Um, my primary focus was her and my kids. I wasn't even on the list and I suffered for that. And I know that, and I know that I will never do that again. So I encourage everyone to remember that you are just as important as those that you're caring for. This is such important work you're doing, Janice. I am grateful and I know women who are listening to you are going to realize all the things that they need to start thinking about for themselves. And they're going to be grateful for all the advice and the insight you're sharing. How can people get a hold of you 
and have direct conversations with you and engage your services, your counseling, your advice? How can they do that? Well, thank you so much. Anyone that is interested in getting in touch with me, I do have a website. It is www.janice, my, I'm sorry, my angel Janice, C E O L D dot com. My email is my angel Janice, C E O L D at gmail dot com. If you would like to set up a 20 minute introduction session, I am on an educational platform called Pick My Brain dot world. If you would like to have me do a presentation for you or for your group, uh, I am able to do that. And all you need to do is either email me or give me a call or a text at 440-494-6263. I look forward to working with all of you. I want you to have that empowerment and I want to help you to take those steps so that you are not caught on the short end of the primary caregiver role because we all need to take care of ourselves as well as each other. Beautiful. As we're wrapping this up, every time the time just flies right by, but is there one tiny little golden nugget uh, to give us and then Cass will wrap this up? Well, my mantra is we plan for birth. Let's plan for death too. That is very profound. Thank you so much, Janice, for helping us educate our community. And thank you for investing in women as they go through the challenging times of their life. Let's face it, as women, $1 billion worth of work is done all over the world every single day for no pay. That is truly the financial impact of the free work women do for families and members of their extended families in this caregiving role and nurturing role. And when you do all that and you don't plan for yourself, you don't give yourself the opportunity, then there are other things that can go wrong in life. So we truly want every woman who's listening to this, every woman who has a relationship with other men and women who can educate them, please take a moment and plan for your life. In Look at it as risk mitigation. Death is guaranteed. But how it happens, we don't know. Just like we buy insurance for the car, what are the people and processes we need to put in place just in case? Because that peace of mind is worth a lot of money and having a plan then truly helps us make our choices prudently so that we are left with no choice. We wish you all the best and please go live a full life but plan for the closing scene as well.